Hello, friends. Greg Kokel here and uh, black, back in the saddle again. Uh, missed you last week. Sorry about that. Uh, I guess we had shows, but there were ones we had in the can just for such occasions as when I get uh, under the weather. I don't know. I have some kind of stomach flu or something, man, and it was no fun. And uh, I lost about seven pounds. Probably most of it was water. <laughs> But it was a bad couple of days there for me. But uh, back rolling again. And um, good news, bad news here about um, Dallas Reality coming up this weekend. And the good news is it is completely sold out. That is every seat in the main auditorium and every seat in the overflow. That's 2,600. Uh, and the bad news is that it's completely sold out. <laughs> which is bad news if you didn't get your tickets. But there's more good news, and the good news is this is the event that we stream. <clears throat> so this is going to be filmed. It'll be streaming. You can go to Reality Student uh, Apologetics website called realityapologetics.com, and all the details are there. Lots of people have signed up for streaming. If you're in town, you can't make it. You can do the streaming. If you're on the other side of the world, you can still do the streaming. So that's all available. And this is, <clears throat> I will just say, in my humble opinion, the best reality we have ever done. And that is entirely due to the creative work of our incredible team. And Friday night is the Don't Miss event. If you, if you can't do the whole thing, Please tune in for the Friday night event because it is so unique and so special and so much fun and so substantive. Uh, I don't want you to miss it. In fact, I'll be there, obviously, all of them, but I drag my wife along for this time, too. So she's on the docket with me. We're fr flying out. I got a buddy ticket for her, you know, with my <clears throat> my Delta perks, and uh, she'll be there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and coming back Sunday with me. So um, we're, that'll be nice to have her, and I'll have some other friends that we'll be meeting there as well. But we're really excited about the event coming up. Uh, incidentally, Philly is filling up. Right now we have 907, and we're four weeks away, of 1,100 plus 200. So we have uh, roughly 900 of and 400 to go, right? Is that right? Nine, one, two, yeah, 400 seats. That 200, by the way, is overflow. So we got uh, 900 and 200 left in the main auditorium, 200 for overflow, and likely we will so sell that one out. We have actually sold out every single event, with the kind of modest exception of um, Minneapolis, because that's uh, Grace Church Eden Prairie that holds, what, 4,100 or so, and we had 3,800, which means for all intents and purposes, you can't really get a whole lot more people in. There's a couple hundred more seats there, but they're scattered around. And you can't get 400 people, I'm sorry, 4,000 people into 10 rooms for breakouts. I mean, that's another big problem. So we, we're at capacity everywhere we've gone, which I think makes the point that young people who are Christians and followers of Jesus want to make a difference in their culture and want answers to the hard questions, which is why they show up and why they take notes and why they're fired up about the next year's event. And we keep increasing our numbers. So we took a, li a little bit of a hit during COVID. But that was the same year, 2020, we opened up Seattle. And um, and that sold out now last fall. Okay, so there you go. Good news, bad news, good news. Um, I am always suspicious of statistics that report how the culture... Um, views Christian, Christianity and Christians. All right? Here's a, a question that was sent to me once. It's often said that Christians are judgmental, homophobic, moralistic. How do you counteract these common charges leveled against Christianity? Now, I've heard this kind of question in, in lots of different ways, but it still amounts to the same thing. And my response is, because I know where it's coming from, the feeling is we are doing something wrong. And therefore, we've got to fix what we're doing because we have a, we have a public image problem. And I don't take those reports that way. 
I think if we're doing something right in the context of this culture, this is precisely the way that we are going to be characterized. How do you um, counteract these common charges? I don't counteract them. Why not? Because Christianity, and therefore the Christians that follow Christ, the Christ of Christianity, is, that is, Christianity is judgmental. It is moralistic. And according to today's standards, it is homophobic. Of course, all homophobic means is not that you're fearful of gays or that you're you hate gays or that you are um, hostile to gays. It's just that you think that homosexuality is not God's purpose or plan, and those who engage in it are doing something wrong. Just like those who engage in adultery or heterosexual sex outside of marriage are doing something wrong. And nowadays, that's considered oppressive, because in the old days, oppression means you hurt people, like physically, or you take something away from them physically, or you prevent them from getting something they deserve physically. That is not the way it's viewed now. Now, in this new age, it's, it, it's oppression by ideology. That is, if you hold a view that others don't hold and are bugged because you disagree with them, that is counted as oppression. Your ideology oppresses me. Even saying what you believe oppresses me. You must be silent. That's called oppression by ideology. And it's part of the critical race theory spectrum. Um, and even if it's not CRT proper that you're dealing with, or it's variations, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you, this still has an impact. If we don't believe the right things, if we say the wrong things, then we are oppressors and victimizers by definition. And that's why Jesus, if he were here today, teaching what he taught when he taught it, living how he lived when he lived it, would be considered homophobic and an oppressor. Oh, no, Jesus Jesus campaigned for the for the down and outer, you know, the marginalized, the poor. He never did that a single time. How do I know that? Because I read the Gospels word for word, all four of them, a year and a half ago when I wrote the article, The Legend of the Social Justice Jesus. Did he say anything about the poor? He said some things about the poor. But he wasn't campaigning for the poor, that is, the financially destitute as such. Old Testament prophets had things to say about that, not Jesus. Jesus did not campaign for the marginalized as such. Where? Where is it that he did that? Oh, the woman caught in adultery. Okay, you got one instance. Here's the problem with that. First of all, it's not canonical. It's not in the originals. Now, I actually think that event really happened because of the unique way that Jesus in the event, woman caught in adultery, John 7, 8, comported himself, but he wasn't campaigning for the marginalized. She was a sinner. She was caught in the very act, but it was a trap by the Jews meant to trap Jesus. And Jesus thwarted the trap, according to the narrative there, and then told the woman, go and sin no more. He was not campaigning for the marginalized. Where did he ever campaign for the marginalized? He preached to everybody. What he cared about was sinners. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax gatherer. By the way, both were rich. But it was the tax gatherer beating his breast, saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner, that was justified. So it is the impulse, though, because people don't like us and they're mad at us because we're moralistic, judgmental, and homophobic, that I think compel some people to put on a different face to appeal more to the culture so they don't think so ill of us. <clears throat> Sometimes the culture thinks ill of Christians for 
I want to say the right reasons, but it, it won't come out right. But that's what I mean. In other words, if we're doing the right things, they're going to feel that way about us. Uh, Jesus himself said, be careful when all men speak well of you. And so when there are campaigns that come out that are meant to put a different face on Christianity, and therefore a different face on Jesus, in opposition to the way secular folk, the world, understand and view Christians now, a red flag goes up to me, for me. And that's what happened when I watched the Super Bowl. Now, I took my wife to Santa Barbara that Sunday for a little overnight for Valentine's, because on Valentine's Day proper, I was supposed to be here, and that's when I got sick when we went out of town. But I didn't watch the football game. I recorded it and then saw it the next day. And uh, that's when I saw the commercials. He gets us. He gets us. Now, there were two commercials. They were one minute long, one towards the beginning and one towards the end. I knew these commercials were there. I'd been alerted to it in Palm Springs the week before by someone who was telling me about it, was kind of excited about it. And when he told me the details of it, I thought, you know, <clears throat> I'm not sure if this is going to actually play well. And I guess what I meant, no, that's not what I meant. What I, what I said is, I'm not sure this is going to actually represent Christ accurately. That's what I was concerned with. <clears throat> and when people start speaking ill of us for, I guess I want to say, the right reasons, in other words, because we're doing what we ought to. This is where Jesus said in Matthew 5, we should be rejoice and be glad because we're being faithful to him when they speak ill of us. Now, that's not always the case. Of course, sometimes they speak ill of Christians because Christians are acting inappropriately. Okay, if that's the case, shame on us. However, if it's because we are being faithful, not just in word, but also in deed to Christ, we are being faithful in the way, in what we communicate and the way we communicate it. And this is our emphasis at Stand a Reason. Communicate the truth as graciously, as accurately, as intelligibly, persuasively as possible, and then let the chips fall. Okay? When we do that and people still don't like us, it's not up to us to put a new face on Jesus and Christianity. And my concern is the He Gets Us commercials do that. Now, you might have seen them on Super Bowl. You can't miss them. They were 60 seconds long. And uh, let's see. I did the math on this. What, 17 million per minute? 24 million? Is that right? Just for those two commercials. I was in Las Vegas this last weekend, got in late last night because my daughter was having a volleyball tournament there. We drove out on Friday, and I did a lot of work while, you know, they played volleyball. I only saw one game, but uh, driving down the strip, bam, there they are. And these big, giant marquees, there are the 60-second videos playing. And one of them was really sweet video of kids doing cute things and embracing each other and looking all so lovable. And then the tagline at the end, Jesus gets us. He, Jesus, I'm quoting now, didn't want us to act like adults. Really? Is that what Jesus meant when he said that we should receive the kingdom like children? That he didn't want us to act like adults? That entails a whole lot, doesn't it? Not acting like adults. No, I think Jesus had something particular in mind, but it certainly can't be, pardon me, captured in the summary statement, Jesus didn't want us to act like adults. What are we teaching our children? If Jesus didn't want our kids to grow up and be adult-like. Oh, my goodness. 
Now, there's some good Christians apparently behind this whole enterprise, and this has caused consternation with some critics. Oh, I know who's paying for these. This is the this group or that group. And so this is a, I actually read this article where it, this seemed like an underhanded attempt at culture wars to enforce some kind of Christian enterprise in our culture, when in fact I think it's quite the opposite. But this is the way it was read. Why? Because that's where all the money's coming from, hundreds of million, at least $100 million. I mean, because all these ads add up, not just the Super Bowl. No, I think uh, the agenda is quite clear, and if you go to hegetsus.com, it says, we have an agenda, and you click that, and you see the agenda. And, you know, I was thinking as I talked to my staff at first about this, having seen just the commercials, that <clears throat> basically this might be a well-intended thing by Christians, because I'd heard the, uh, the Green family, the Hobby Lobby crowd, was somewhat behind this alpha, uh, the seminars, these were promoting, encouraging. I don't know how much money they put into it, but anyway, good Christians from all I could tell doesn't mean their efforts were right-headed. They might have been right-hearted. And I was thinking, gee, maybe this is just a clever way to get people to hegetsus.com, and then they give the real substance instead of just this Jesus gets us. He doesn't want us to act like adults. He wants us to be like these kids. Or the other one where there's a lot of screaming back and forth between people, and it was a lot of clips and shots and pictures, and it was very it, it was hard to watch because it was so well done. Production values, the both videos that I saw were fabulous. And then Jesus' comment or the statement about Jesus at the end, Jesus loved the people we hate, which in this case, that's not controversial. The idea of Jesus didn't want us to act like adults seems to me a distortion of the point Jesus was making about receiving the kingdom like a child, but certainly not this one. Jesus did love the people we hate, but is that the sum of it? What What is being communicated here about Jesus? If I had $28 million to communicate to the Super Bowl crowd, crowd about Jesus, is this the message I want them to get? Oh, well, maybe that's just a, a teaser to get to the website where there's more substance, but there wasn't more substance. The agenda was Christianity has an ugly face to the world. We're going to give it a nicer face and try to show people that Jesus gets us, whatever that means. So he gets us, and he did nice things. But the thing that he gets about us that is most critical in an eternal sense, is that we are lost in rebellion to him. And incidentally, this this isn't something that Jesus shied away from. You start off from the very beginning in Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and he starts talking about the demand after the blessed stuff, which is really sweet. Then he starts talking about the demands of the law. And I think I've mentioned this before. This is my summation of that section. You think you're holy? you got to be more holy than the most holy people among you, more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, more holy than the Pope, to put it in more modern terms, in order to qualify. That's not good news. That's bad news. For example, you're not supposed to murder. Oh, I didn't do that. Did you ever call your brother a fool? (laughs) Of course, you're going to hell. Huh? And don't commit adultery. Didn't do that. Did you ever think about it? Uh, yep. You're going to hell. What happened to Jesus meek and mild? Loving everybody, wanting us to be like children, loving his enemies. No, that wasn't the message he communicated. What he communicated was not our problem towards other people, but our problem regarding God. And that was the problem he came to solve, to rescue us from. In fact, virtually everything he said and everything everybody else of authority said about him regarding his mission was all the same. He came to, in some, in his words, to seek and to save that which was lost. 
to call sinners to repentance. There was not a a line in any of those two videos. They didn't watch the rest of them. There's more on their website. There was not a line on the website that in the slightest sense, as far as I could find, intimated that Jesus came to save sinners. He did not come to help us all get along. And I did have a concern if there was a, you know, one kind of appeal at the Super Bowl, they came to the website and they got find something more substantial, something more biblical, something more sound, something more to the point of the mission of Christ, there was going to be a sense of bait and switch, right? That wouldn't look good for them, but th- there was... <laughs> There was plenty of bait, but there was no switch, no substance. What Jesus turns out to be is this really great guy we should emulate. We ought to be like him. He got us. He understood us. We should be like him. That's not his message. That's not the core. Once we understand the core and we are brought to him in repentance and surrender, then he works to make us more like him once the sin issue that separates us from the Father is resolved. But before first things first, right? First you catch the fish, and then you clean them, to cite a phrase. So none of that is in this website. In fact, there is quite a bit, as they the principles in this enterprise express their view that disavows that. We're not trying to do that thing. We're not trying to push any particular theology. We're not trying to get people into church. That's that's what they say. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, not because I'm trying to cause division, and incidentally, this is the claim that's made. Oh, you Christians complaining about this, you're causing division. We are rightly dividing. If you want to use that language, division, okay. Rightly dividing. Wheat from chaff, truth from error. Jesus' true mission from some other thing that distracts people. Our goal is not to make Jesus or Christianity look kinder and gentler. He's plenty kind and he's plenty gentle enough. Our goal is to reflect precisely why he came to be faithful to that and to follow him in that and reflect it to the world and then take what the world dishes out. We don't have to be mean and and return their meanness. No, we don't have to do that. We can love our enemies like Jesus did. That's true. But that isn't, Jesus didn't come as a moral example. And this is one of the things, by the way, that you see there. It's very frustrating. Now, I've used quite a bit of time here. I've got some callers on board. I need to get to them. But I, I want to mention a couple of things that Natasha Crane, a colleague, friend, who's been on the show many times, wrote in response to this strategy. He gets us. as She actually wrote this in October or so. And uh, the title... i got to get it. i got to get it here. The title is Seven Problems with the He Gets Us campaign. Natasha Crane, October 27. 22. Seven problems with the He Gets Us campaign. Just read it. She took incredible grief for this from Christians. All kinds of hate mail from Christians. But she identifies some really important things. Actually, seven problems. One, the fact that Jesus gets us stripped from the context of his identity is meaningless. I'll just give you a quick summary of some of these right here. No, if Jesus isn't God, why does it matter? He's just a nice guy. He's a guy who did good. Okay, lots of people did good. And the fact that they suffered and they understand us in suffering, so what? It's only God become man who understands us in suffering can help us through it and forgive us for our contribution to it that makes a difference. Number two, Jesus is presented as an example, not a Savior. I already mentioned that. Number three, campaign reinforces the problematic idea that Jesus' followers have Jesus all wrong. Really? Yeah, we just don't get it. In fact, the first line of the explanation of the agenda 
talks about Jesus being someone who advocated for the poor and for the socially marginalized, which itself is a false statement given the record. By the way, there are pastors who say this, even though they don't diminish his ministry to those kinds of things, as some will do, especially progressives. They still say, well, you know, he did do that. He didn't do that. Go to str.org, look up the piece, the legend of the social justice Jesus. I quantify every verse there. It just isn't there. How about this one? The campaign reinforces what culture wants to believe about Jesus while leaving out what culture doesn't want to believe. That is really critical. That's a huge problem. We just give one side, because that's the side they want to hear. And if we give the one side the one that they want to hear, which turns out to be somewhat of a distortion, as I just pointed out, they're not going to be mad at us. They're going to like us. Why are they going to like us? Because we're saying what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Finally, I'll mention the campaign stated goal is about inspiration, not a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's right in the, the website. You go to it. Natasha Crane, Seven Problems with the He Gets It campaign. Please be alerted to this. Now, here's why this why why I care about you knowing this. What what I I've said this so many times over the many years that I've been doing this with you. I don't want to just teach you what to think. I want to teach you how to think. Stand a reason does. All of our players want to teach that. So in a sense, I'm teaching, I'm, I'm alerting you to a problem, okay? I'm alerting you to this attempt to recharacterize Jesus in a way that is not accurate, taken as a whole, taken as, given the impact of the campaign, not accurate to the person of Christ ref, reflected in the Scripture itself. <clears throat> so that's in a sense a fact. Oh, that's not the real deal. But what I want you to see, too, in a broader sense, is something going on here, and that is the attempt of culture and Christians to modify and to um, make more user-friendly the Christ of Scripture, because people are mad at what Scripture says regarding particular things that are not publicly popular. And the temptation for Christians when others push back Oh, you're homophobic, you're judgmental, you're moralizing. Yes, yes, and yes. In a certain sense of the word. If homophobic means that we think homosexual behavior is wrong, that's God's homophobic. The Bible is thick with morality. The bad news is we don't do what's right. Good news is there's a rescue. Two kinds of rescue. There's forgiveness for the wrong and the power then to do what's right once we're cleansed of the wrong. Judgmental? The gospel entails a judgment. He who believes is not judged, but he who does not believe is judged already. John chapter 3, Jesus. The light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What narrow-minded, arrogant, moralizing judgmental person said that, Jesus of Nazareth. It comes right after, for God so loved the world that he gave. Remember that verse? What, one or two verses later, there's this judgment from Jesus on the world, and his judgments are true and accurate. Now, of course, we have to be careful how we communicate, so it doesn't sound or seem like we are simply being condescending that wasn't Jesus' way, but he was clear about the judgments he made because people don't understand the judgment against them from God's perspective. They are not going to consider the mercy available to them through Christ. And so what I want you to see broadly here is watch out for these things. The minute I heard about this in Palm Springs, I thought, mm, something stinks in Denmark. Is that the way the phrase goes? I don't know. This sounds like what I've seen before, and I was open about it, waiting to see, and 
of course. In some ways, it was worse. Jesus doesn't want us to act like adults, really. That's the best you could do for that. Anyway, so be wise, be alert, be kind, but do not be deceived. And I encourage you to read Natasha's piece, Seven Problems with the He Gets Us campaign. All right, let's go to break and calls in just a moment on Stand to Reason. All right, friends, Greg Kogel back at you here, Stand to Reason, uh, giving you a piece of my mind as I do every Tuesday uh, from 4 until 6 p.m. Los Angeles time. The phone number is 855-243-9975 to call in live during that time. If you're interested in open mic calls, we do that too, 857-342-5787. This is the phone number you can call. I think Amy prefers if you go to the website. Is that right? Okay. Just go to our homepage and under podcasts, find live broadcasts and follow the prompts, and then you could just speak your question either into the phone or into your computer, and it'll come to us, and, uh, and we will eventually get to it. I have like two pages uh, worth of stuff right here and uh, people calling in, but we get to them eventually. And like last week when I was sick, um, we use a, call, a, a show that I did in advance with those open mic calls. So no, that wasn't what we did? Okay, well, in general... Amy's, like, waving me off there. Okay, when I'm not here in the future, it gives us opportunity to use these these calls that we have done shows with, blah, blah, blah. Okay, John in somewhere in the Midwest. Welcome to Stand a Reason. Glad you called. Hi, Greg. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, my wife and I are refugees from a, oh, a church that went woke. Huh. Um, social gospel and all they're recommending yeah. like Jamar Tisby, Ibram Kendi, Robin D'Angelo books oh, to all their congregation and, and um anyway, I wrote letters to the elders and met with several of them in person, met with several staff in person, met with a senior minister in person. And it just I felt like we just need to leave so we wouldn't divide the church. You know, it caused a divisive type thing in the church. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we live this happened, you know, in uh, twenty twenty, middle mm-hmm. of COVID. Mm-hmm. So we did church at home for a while, and then we uh, we were welcomed by a beautiful church family with solid pastoral staff, a godly, humble hearts, and they're strongly encouraging us to become members. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And that's where the problem comes in. I mean, I'm happy to to you know give to that church like I gave to any other church, and generously, and to to sit under their teaching and and discipleship and and correction if I need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they they want you to make vows to join. And I don't know that I've ever made a vow to join a church before, but, I, I, you know, Ecclesiastes 5, five says it's better to not vow than to vow and not fulfill it. Yeah. And in you know, my last church, you know, I couldn't <laughs> fulfill it by staying there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, under their discipleship. Um, but um, I'll, I'll likely never consider myself a Reformed Presbyterian, uh, and I just wonder, if it's, it's, is it right to become a member? Uh, is I've, that the church? Is it a Reformed Presbyterian yeah, church? Yes, okay. yes sir. Uh-huh. Uh, I've served as an elder in two past churches, and and I would not be eligible there to be an elder, although I don't, you know, I've seen the underbelly of the church, and I don't really want to be an elder anymore, you know. <laughs> uh-huh. But um, uh, but considering my views, particularly a paedo baptism would be uh, disqualifying. Mm-hmm. And uh, they do accept other churches' baptisms, as long as it's been done by an ordained clergy. Mm-hmm. I baptized five of my children, some of them as a layman, and some of them are holding office of elder elsewhere. Mm-hmm. But So I haven't asked about whether they'd be willing to baptize someone by immersion if requested. Mm-hmm. But I suspect their answer would be no, because the Church has no baptistry. Mm-hmm. Well, they consider- there, there may be other water available, so, well, but, yeah, but I there's... understand that it's a doctrinal concern for them. Yeah. Uh, and I so there's a lot of things going on here. I think John, um, uh, if I would never be able to be a, a bona fide member of that church because I was not baptized by someone who is an ordained pastor, as my brother who baptized me. And um, there are certain things that are in play here that are not uh, biblically required, like membership in a church is there's no biblical 
requirement for that. I'm not even, I have never been the member of a church. I'm 50 years a Christian. I have never been <laughs> a, an official member of the church of a church. I have been a de facto member, but I don't remember ever signing anything off and saying, "Okay, now I'm in a member." Even the church I go to now, I'm not a official member, and I guess they wouldn't let me vote if uh, if a vote came up members only. Okay, I'm not the slightest bit troubled by that. Um, when it comes to uh, a baptism, I mean, pedal baptism wasn't infant baptism wasn't clearly. Uh, practiced in the early church. There were young people who became Christians and got baptized, but there's no indication that when children were born they of Christian parents, this became a habit. All right. Now, there may be arguments for it, whatever, but I'm just simply saying that some of these things that are requirements now for certain churches turn out to be requirements of their organization that aren't exactly biblical requirements, you know, or being baptized by an ordained minister. There were no such thing as ordained <laughs> ministers for centuries, for goodness sake, you know. Uh, otherwise, uh, Paul would have been baptized in a whole lot more than he did. That's, well, goodness sake, you know, and so it's, it's, it can be a little frustrating when you face that kind of thing. Now, it, it, this doesn't disqualify the Church, if, you know, I held to the doctrines broadly of Reformed Presbyterian, and I probably do. I'm not confessional, so I'm not into pedal baptism, and that would be part of covenant theology, But I, uh, so I don't confess all of that. I could still feel very comfortable in, the, in, in a church like that, even though I differed on this particular point of view, because to me this is much, this is secondary or tertiary. Other things would be more important to me, and being able to receive instruction and being involved in a useful way in that body, whether they let me vote or not, is irrelevant. Now, they might say, unless you're a member of the church, you can't lead a Bible study, or you can't do a group, or you can't give a talk or something. Well, that would be a little bit more difficult for me. But, um, I mean, I, <laughs> I have people who invite me to their church to speak, and I'm not a member, so I don't know why— if I stayed there and I was there, that I couldn't speak if I wasn't. You know, it's it's right. this is where right. it gets a little bit goofy, you know, and it, where human rules then start to get in the way of 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 biblical uh, patterns or biblical um, uh, motifs. You know, if I have a gift, I'm supposed to use my gift in the local body that I'm a part of. But if somebody says, well, our rule says that unless you sign on the dotted line and make this vow, you can't use your gift in our church, then why is it a human rule is disqualifying a divine directive? Mm. Je Jesus ran into that. So this, this, this is, troubles me. Now, uh, again, I could be in a church like that, depending on how— I guess, aggressive they were about these things, their attitude about it, and how all-encompassing these restrictions happen to be, you know. And it may be that I'm just feeling, oh, that's just, I'm not comfortable here. I'm going to have to find someplace else. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't require of myself even, and certainly not of others, that they agree with every single thing that the Church teaches. Um, I mean, frankly, it's the only church that I could go to that would agree with every single thing I teach is a church that I was the pastor of, <laughs> and then I might still not agree right. with some uh, of the things I taught. So yeah. that, that, I think, is an excessive requirement, but it can get to a point where, in a sense, push comes to theological shove, and you say, you know, there's too many things that I'm just not comfortable with here. I am troubled, though, a little bit by the whole idea of making this vow. What does this vow entail, and why do I have to make a vow in order to be part of this local community and make a contribution? Do I have to make a vow before you accept my tithe or offering or whatever, you know? My gifts, I should say, because I'm not—I don't hold to tithing. But, uh, I mean, that'd be an interesting question. If you, can't, if you can't vote or do these different things unless you make the vow, well, will you still take my money? Yeah, well, yeah. they'll be happy to do that, but yeah. I'm happy to give it because they feed me. Of you course. Know, they're, they're a good church, I, yes. and they're really good people. We love them, and they love us. And they, they've really welcomed us in a mm -hmm. great way. And uh, and I, I have confidence in the current pastoral staff. But right. you know, the last church we went to just had a change of pastors, and mm -hmm. uh, 
and so, uh, like I was listening to one of your podcasts the other day, and the guy that uh, uh, is, that you were telling him you think it's maybe time to go, you know? Yeah, uh, right. It's kind of that same kind of thing that happened to us a couple of years ago. So I'm not, uh, you know. So not, what what would be your misgivings about just staying where you're at and uh, being part of the community? It, it, let's just say you bypass the vow. Well, that's the way I look at it because you know I consider myself part of the church worldwide. You know, I'm, I'm sure. body of Christ, and I don't care what the you know the brick building looks like because that's not what I'm a part of. Uh-huh. And uh, and you know, this local congregation, I think it's important for me to, to be uh, attending and, and to be sitting under somebody's uh, discipleship and maybe sure. even discipline if I need it. Right. And I trust the two guys that are in charge there because I think they're godly men. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, like the senior pastor said, well, you got to keep shacking up with this, or we're going to get married. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a bit of a a poor metaphor, because the shacking up is illicit, obviously, right. and it's like you're, uh, you're kind of on for a free ride. And I think it would be fair to say, wait a minute, I'm a part of this community. I receive from you guys. It's wonderful. I love you guys, everybody else. And I, I uh, give offerings uh, and gifts to the church financially in response to what I'm being fed. I am a part of this community. Now, so what am I missing? Oh, uh, well, you haven't joined the group. Okay, so then wh- wh- why, why, should I, why do I need to do that in order to enjoy the fellowship? And uh, it might be, well, he might say, well, why won't you? And they say, well, I'm making a vow about something, and the vow entails details that I am committed to hold to. And so maybe I'm not comfortable, and I don't mm-hmm. know what those details are, but you, you probably are more aware of it. Maybe you're not comfortable making a vow of that sort with this group at this time. But why? But that doesn't mean you're shacking up with them. Yeah. Yeah, right. Why don't well, you call it to say, don't, don't worry, Pastor, it's a common law marriage. <laughs> yeah, right. How about that? <laughs> That's true. Well, we've been there a couple of years, so it could be that yeah. by now. But, um, yeah, there, uh, I think the difference would be I, I could vote. I don't really care about voting much. I trust the others to vote. Sure. Uh, I, I think I could even teach Sunday school without being a member. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it'd be the young kids, probably, but I, I don't know. I haven't asked that I question. imagine you could volunteer for projects and just be part of the oh, life yeah. of the church. Yeah, I, yeah I, we I, serve in other ways there, too, yeah. Of course. We do. Uh, and and we, you know, we're happy to do that. But um, I'm, uh, you know, that the pa- I can live with most of the other Reformed doctrine stuff, and I haven't been Reformed most of my life. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know... I, I I can I can you know limited atonement I struggle with you know I don't see why God didn't love so love the whole world but uh, you know that kind of thing uh, I I just well, uh, well l- let me speak to that in just a minute I just want to say a few things about that because this is a stumbling block for a lot of people and I think I have a way of characterizing that might be helpful but go ahead so you, you there are some things doctrinally you're just not totally on board with or confused well, about doesn't mean you can't be a member of that church in in good standing or uh, a de facto member of the church in good standing, even if your name's not on the roll. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to say about limited atonement is the limit is the application. It isn't the limit of God's desire. It isn't the limit of the capability of Christ. It's who it applies for. So what if, let's just say I was an Arminian when it comes to this whole, this broader issue of salvation. What I would say is that the blood of Christ is limited in its application to those who fulfill the requirement of benefiting from it, and that is faith in Jesus. And faith in Jesus is something that we do ourselves that God doesn't do for us. So I'm just going to take the Arminian point. Notice how I characterized it, though, that the blood or the the efficacious, the effective feature of the blood of Christ is available only to those who satisfy the requirement. It's limited to that. Well, I wouldn't be at all opposed to that kind of a, a, a well, yeah, I, that, I agree with that. But, you know, the whole doctrine of election, you know, and free will thing seems in conflict with whosoever will may come, whosoever receives him, if you repent and believe, all that, you know, it, it seems like it's something that... Okay, so let me ask you conflict. this question. Let me ask you this question, because now, now we went from so-called limited atonement, which is a way of looking at it that's completely uncontroversial, and this, by the way, is my way of characterizing what particular atonement amounts to. 
Jesus intended to pay only for those people who satisfied the requirement of faith. That's it. He didn't pay for anybody else because if he paid for anybody else, then those people without faith would still be forgiven since it was already paid. Right. It's available, but it's not paid. But how how is how precisely is whoever will may come inconsistent with election? Because that still applies even with sovereign well election is the new testament word i mean i, I don't this is what mystifies me because the words are <laughs> election god elects so if god's electing whoever will may come and the people who do come are willing and god takes whoever wills mm. but there if a person isn't willing then he doesn't come so right. it, that's that verse that you just or that principle you just suggested still applies from uh, from a reform perspective, whoever will may come, mm. and the people who do come are the ones that God has worked against their rebellion to bring them to a place of faith in Christ, where they will to come. So uh, anyway, it's just just something to think mm. about. I'm not going to obviously change. Well, my like mind I now, said, but... that I'm coming around on those issues. I think, and I know you're kind of uh, reformed in your thinking. Well, with uh, regards but... to the cross, uh, yeah. yeah, that's to me so, it's. Yeah. I come in there. I'm getting there. I can understand <laughs> this thing, but the the baptism thing, you know, it's just. I even uh, even John Calvin, I think, was uh, quick to say that immersion was how they did it in the first century, and and they're big about the regulative principle. Why don't they do it the way the yeah, <laughs> New uh, Testament uh, calls for it? You know. Sure, I I'm with you on that, and uh, that uh, that is an area that I I believe in. I hold to Christian baptism, and I don't know that a person has to be immersed to be baptized. Yeah, if you're in a desert, you could be— I agree with that. I heard yeah. one person said, I don't care if you've been dipped, sprinkled, or spit on. You know, it still counts. Right. As a, so anyway— if, if you're a believer, right. Yeah, that's but, right. You know, it's what, the, if you're in, what if you're in the North Pole? There you what go. What if you're in the Saudi Arabian desert? There you, know, you, you go. You, you can't be doing immersion in places like that. So sand, I, I, sand can, the baptism. I get along with that. I can, I'd rather see it immerse, you know, an immersion by baptism, right. but— it doesn't have to be if it's you know, extenuate circumstances. I can understand. It it does seem immersion does seem to to capture the picture of what happens in baptism better than sprinkling. So when you read in a, what Romans six etc., right. you know you right. just get this sense of this you know much better in a water situation, a full immersion situation. Okay, that John, I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. I thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate you taking me call, and I also I, I was going to say. Uh, to Amy, I was going to tell her I was so happy I was to talk to the wonderful Amy Hall. So you pass that on to her if you would. Oh, please. well, she hears you. She's <laughs> chuckling right now, and you're right. She is wonderful. Okay, uh, thanks so right. much. All right, Thank buddy. You, Greg. All right. Good night. Good night. Let's go to uh, Larry here, and Larry in Fremont, California. Welcome to the show. You made it. Oh, th thank you so much, Greg. I wanted to say before I get to my comment, and you probably know this, but. You're on a pop album. <laughs> You're uh, uh, the group Negative Land. Uh, their album called "It's All in Your Head," and uh, you're uh, on one of the one of the track. Your voice is on one of the tracks on that album. Oh, is that right? Uh, did Did you know that? No, it's I never a, even heard of it. I don't know. No idea. It's totally new to yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, again, the album's called "It's All in Your Head" by Negative Land, and the track you're on is called. Uh, uh, all along with the story, I think that's it. No kidding. Is, is it disparaging, or is it just kind of tongue in cheek, or I don't well, know? Well, um, the album is uh, it's kind of fun. It's a, it has people talking about uh, uh, many different religions, and they use the voices of the people themselves. Uh -huh. Okay. It's kind of mixed in with music and sound. All right. Effect. Well, I don't mind. It's at a all. lot of that's, fun. Yeah, yeah the, uh, that's good. You're that's on good. Uh, track six. All Alone with Just a Story. Okay. You probably remember that lecture where you where you used that. Yeah. Could, uh, yep. That was your lecture on uh, solipsism. So my, my 15 minutes of fame there on that album. So uh, um, more than that, it's a, it's a really good album, and and uh, you're you're the main voice featured on that track. No kidding. Okay. So let's get to your question, though, because yeah, we're running out well, of time, though. Because you, you know, can... I think it's it's really understandable people have a negative impression of Christianity because some Christians do uh, advocate really bad things. 
I mean, I, I could give a lot of examples. I remember uh, Pat Robertson on his show uh, visiting a terror, terrorist group down in Mozambique, a group called a Renamo. Uh-huh. And he actually not not only funded this group and supplied them with supplied them with uh, uh, you know food and uh, whatever various supplies so they could use their money to buy guns. Okay, so but, I, I don't I don't know about this illustration, but let me just plead guilty in a certain sense. Generally, you're always going to be able to find Christians that do bad things, even Christian leaders who seem to do bad things. There's no question at all about that, but that's always been the case. You can cherry pick. It's like for me to say, you know what? I used to consider atheism until I find out how many atheists were mass murderers. Okay, now, no atheist is going to buy that as an argument against atheism. But people, because most atheists aren't mass murderers, but people buy that against Christianity all the time. And this is, this is my concern that, that I raised earlier. Is that, is that when Christians are characterized in these negative fashion, it's, it's like across the board. This is what Christianity is like. Not that there's some nasty Christians. Obviously, there's going to be. But the, the, I think the complaint against Christianity is based on ideology. Christianity is a judgmental religion. It is homophobic, according to their characteristics, characterization of the word. It is a judgmental. And to that I say, yes, it is on all of those, because it he- deals with sinful mankind, and the Spirit has come to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. So if a, someone is going to characterize anybody who says anything is wrong that they're doing as judgmental and, and moralistic and, in one case, homophobic— well, then we have to plead guilty to that, even if we're the nicest people in the world. Do you see the distinction there? I do, but i got to say, in many cases, it's the voices advocating violence and war are the predominant voices in uh, Christian media, Christian radio, Christian TV. Okay, this is, uh, well, you say Christian media, Christian radio, that that has not been my experience, and I've been in media, Christian media, for 33 years here. Here's what I think is going on, and and uh, my, I ask my question, where do most people get their information about anything, especially about Christians and Christianity? And they get it from the media. But these people who are getting it from the media are not listening to KKLA or Salem Radio or whatever. They're listening to other broadcasts from the, the legacy media that's giving their take on things. The reason that Christians have the, I'm sorry, that non Christians have these points of view about Christians is because what they're hearing other people say about Christians, not because they are in churches encountering Christians on a daily basis and all of the incredible things that Christian churches are doing for the down and out and the poor people and stuff like that. That's what I think is going on here. Well, I got to say, personally, I was discouraged for many years from becoming a Christian, because it just looked to me like like Christians are bad guys. Where where did it look to you like that from? From Christian radio. More, more than not, I listen to Christian radio a lot. And I heard a, a lot of... <laughs> I heard a lot of pro-war stuff on uh, the uh, um, San Francisco... I think it's Salem Broadcasting and San Francisco uh-huh. Station actually broadcast a interview with the uh, the president of Guatemala, Ephraim Rios Montt, uh, and he he murdered uh, hundreds of thousands of Indians yeah. in his country. Well, that and they weren't I, even re- I, I, I rebelling can't. or doing uh, or fighting. They were just kind of in the way. They mm-hmm. wanted to, you know, uh, uh, process the rainforest and turn them into wood or whatever. Sure, the sure. Indians were just in the way. And well, they, I'm not going to defend it. The, the, hundreds the, of thousands of them. Okay, the, and they were the, praising I, him on the show and saying what a wonderful Christian okay, well, he was. I don't, and, I don't have the show in front of me. I didn't listen to that. But I will tell you, in Central America, the vast majority of violence is not done by Christians. It is done by Marxists, okay? And, and so, again, you may I, I can't respond to that particular thing. But when it comes to war— during a time when we're at war, well, now that's a political issue, and different Christians have different attitudes about it. Some are pro regarding any particular war, not pro-war in general, but pro 
this particular war because there's an injustice that needs to be rectified. Anyway, a lot of, we could talk about there. We just ran out of time. Oh, uh, Larry, I do appreciate your call. And uh, that's it for us, friends. Greg Kokel for Santa Reason. Give them heaven, friends. Bye-bye now. <laughs>